good morning and welcome to Zen Live on Saturday, or a new metaphor for your toolbox. And uh, yesterday, the metaphor we talked about was, if you were here, uh, was pain is your big foot. And uh, we've been on the track of the pain body that totally describes as a uh, buried uh, energy uh, uh, field like a whirlpool that lies in the unconscious and rises to feed when the situations are correct. So when you get with somebody with another pain body or you're, you're in a situation where uh, the soil is right, the conditions are right, the pain body will rise to be fed by your life energy. You put you sacrifice your life energy to keep this whirlpool going. When it is sated, it goes down, you say, what the hell happened? Oh, and you're drained. You're, oh. And then you recuperate, and the situation is favorable again, and up comes the fish, the koi, the pain koi. Okay? So we're picking that up today. And the metaphor for today is clean your plate. Now, <laughs> we grow up, we all grow up with uh, a mom who uh, gives us life commandments, most of us, and uh, it seems that most of us have the, our first commandments are clean your plate, finish your food. Don't leave anything there. The starving children in Korea, <laughs> wherever they are, you know, you're so fortunate. Eat it every, eat it all. Clean your plate. Or wash the dishes. Don't leave. You left stuff on the dish. Look at look at that. You left some stuff there. Clean the dish. Or you're vacuuming the floor. You missed a spot, right? Get 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 that. Clean that up. Get that spot. Or uh, you, whatever we do, if you miss a spot, right? <laughs> this is early indoctrination uh, that most of us have. You see, uh, so it's so what you know. So it has a practical household purpose, but in the context of the evolution of our soul, uh, the liberation of our soul or our awareness uh, from pain. They have a different meaning. Now, now you've, and I, I certainly uh, am, am uh, full of sin when it comes to leaving food on my plate. <laughs> my wife now, she cleans her plate clean. I mean, you don't even have to wash it. <laughs> Me, I've got little bits of food left all over it. And I always laugh and say, I leave some for the gods. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I don't know, in, in, in relationships, you know, everybody has their own little uh, different way. And so uh, just to be different, you know, I leave food. But I don't know I'm doing that. It's just I've always just left food on there. Um, or when I, when I was full, I just stopped eating, and there it was, you see. I don't have a compulsive commandment to eat it all after I uh, have finished eating. But anyway, but that's not the point. Uh, the point we're looking at today is, well, let me read Tolley's quote. Uh, well, where is it? <laughs> Here it is. Aha, I didn't, I didn't get all flubbergusted flubba here and, and still running around looking for it. Okay. The remnants of pain left behind by every strong negative emotion that is not fully faced, accepted, and then let go of join together to form an energy field that lives in the very cells of your body. So that's interesting. The remnants of pain left behind by every strong negative emotion that is not fully faced, accepted, and then let go of join together to form an energy field, that whirlpool, that lives in the unconscious and in the cells of the body. See, the body and mind are one, and they reflect each other. We all know that. 
if your posture is bad and you're like this, your mind, that's the posture of your mind that has gone into the cells of your body. So now you're, you're in a constant, or I'm closed. I'm not open, you see. I'm closed. I'm not open. That's an attitude in the cells of the body, you see. Or a constant frown, a droopy face. Oh, poor me. You see, that this, the mental posture becomes a physical posture. That's why yoga is so uh, successful, because it attacks the postures of the mind that are in the body. So if you liberate the body from the cells of the pain body, you begin to liberate the mind. You break up the mind's pain body, you see. So all this practice is kind of like on mental or physical dimensions to break up these energy fields of pain that are like whirlpools that we constantly feed with our life energy uh, because we identify with it. We identify with this pain. I'm a victim. I hurt. You did it. That's identification. But if there is a hurt and you say, oh, there is the feeling of hurt. That's not identifying with it. That's facing it. There is the feeling. You accept it. It exists. There it is. And you don't identify with it. You say, there is the feeling, not I hurt who did it. See the difference? This is the Buddha's first noble truth. There is suffering. Now that can be taken objectively, so there, man, all life is suffering, okay. But when it's done, when the Four Noble Truths are practiced in the first person, now when somebody says something, frowns at you or something, and you feel a personal attack, you say, oh, there is suffering, there is pain. But you don't say, I'm attacked, why'd you frown at me? You see? As soon as you say, I hurt, you identify with the pain, and now that pain is unfinished, it's leftover food on the plate of the moment, and if you can get the visualization of the of, uh, water with a, oh shoot, let me go this. So you get this idea here of a pond, okay? This is conscious here, and this is unconscious here, okay? So you throw food on there for the koi, okay? If you have a betta fish, there you go. Suppose this is a you got a fish and you throw too much food on there and it drops down and he doesn't eat it all, okay? When he eats it, it's gone. But if he doesn't eat it, you put too much on there, this becomes pollution and the fish dies. <laughs> okay. I think that's a great that's a great image, right? So when every every negative emotion that we experience, if we don't eat it, it goes to the bottom of the unconscious and begins to collect as a pain body. And this pain body will then rise up to the surface like a fish to eat. So we feed it our identity, you see. When you say, I hurt, who did it? I hurt, what's the cause? And the cause can be, will be either, there has to be a cause. When you say, I hurt, who or what did it? There has to be a cause because the effect, you see, is the pain. So we split the, the, the pain, the effect, from the cause, and we look around for the cause, you see. Either he did it, 
or I did it. Oh, damn. I'm such a stupid. You see? So we blame ourselves or somebody else. It doesn't make any difference. What's important is that we separate the cause from the effect. And then we naturally believe that if I remove the cause, I'll remove the effect, which is the pain. So if I hurt who did it and he did it, then it's quite logical, very scientific, in the laws of machines. If he's the cause for I hurt, then I can re I got to remove that cause. Now, if I can't make that person apologize, I'm going to balance justice. So I'm going to give him an equal amount of pain that I got, you see. Because now it's like, oh, I got too much pain. He doesn't have any. So I restore balance. I restore balance, you see, zero, by giving him pain to equal my pain. I said this the other day. We watched these uh, Midsummer Mysteries, British Mysteries. And the British have a lot of pain because they have so much history. <laughs> the pain gets passed down through generations. And a crime is committed to, because of the grievance. And the person commits a crime or a murder to bring zero or balance and restore justice by giving that family the pain it gave me, like the Hatfields and the Coys. But you see, this particular logic kicks the pain down the road. It doesn't eliminate it. It just kicks, keeps kicking it down the road, and it keeps expanding. Anyway, though, getting back to the point, the idea that I wanted to share was that a household, here's the idea a household monastery. The household is the monastery. Now there's a metaphor for you. The household is a monastery. Now what does that mean? Okay, now all right, let's go back a few centuries, in the Middle Ages, or you go back to uh, uh, Asia, go to Japan. Uh, Asian countries and the Middle Ages, which gave birth to us, the secular world, all had monasteries or places where those on a spiritual path would go to practice spiritual disciplines like cleaning your plate or washing your clothes or gardening or sweeping the floor simple household duties. I remember back in the 70s when I used to hang out with gurus, you'd go to the guru's ashram, which means teacher's house, and it would be like a retreat. You see, so the ashram, the teacher's ashram, the guru's house became like a monastery. And when you went there, you were focused on the interior world instead of the exterior world of the world and all of the pain bodies and everything. So you went to the ashram to clean up your plate. To, you went to the ashram to fully accept, fully face, accept, and let go of the accumulated pain in the cells of your body and your mind. And that's why, you know, a lot of people would not uh, last at an ashram because uh, the pain's painful. <laughs> I don't want to look at that. Let me get back to uh, my normal, habitual, painful life. At least I know what that is, you see. So this idea, <coughs> this cotton ball that we're pulling apart right now, is the idea that in the secular world, which is the world we live in, which is the bowl, the fish bowl we live in now, is secular. There is no institutional spiritual practice 
or categories. See, we don't even have spiritual categories. <clears throat> you go to India and you see uh, monks, renunciants, yogis, gurus. Every family has a guru, a wise person. Uh, towns, villages, they have a guru. Uh, it, it, it's just part of, the, it's part of the social structure, you see. We don't have this. Islam, they got the mosque and the call to prayer. And everybody in the, in the community turns and bows to Mecca. That is a socially, that, that's like the whole society is like a monastery where you ring the bell and everybody stops and refocuses on unity, refocuses on uh, uh, the interior, indwelling God, you see. Everybody stops and, and uh, takes their shoes off. Everybody stops for a moment of meditation and contemplation to remember who we are, to remember the one, you see. So this, uh, this, this uh, our, our secular world, our secular society, because it's rational and logical and materialistic, it makes all kinds of stuff like this Facebook and this thing here and all that, you see. Uh, so very successful, but very unsuccessful in cleaning up the pain body. So, <clears throat> what do we have to do? Well, we have to create our own retreat, our own monastery, our own ashram, metaphorically, so nobody knows you're doing it. Now, how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> you turn your household into your monastery or ashram or spiritual laboratory. That's a good word. I mean, that fits, that fits in the secular understanding. Laboratory. Well, that's, that's scientific. Uh, that's where you experiment, right? So that, that's got a social place. Laboratory. That everybody, you know, everybody wants a laboratory. So what if it's a spiritual laboratory? Well, if it's a spiritual laboratory, it means it's an interior laboratory. That's what spirit means, interior. There's no form in there. You can't see spirit. So a spiritual laboratory has no exterior form, right? A scientific laboratory has a form. It's got a sign on the door, laboratory. You go in there and it's got all these bottles, like in the Big Bang Theory, all these laboratories, you see. Well, a spiritual laboratory has no form. So it's your laboratory you create it. So now how do you, how do you work in your spiritual laboratory? Okay, when you wash the dishes, <coughs> it's a metaphor. Now the metaphor means that it does two things, two opposite things at once. What are the two opposite things that a metaphor points to? Well, one thing, the metaphor of washing the dishes points to the actual fact of washing the dishes. Nobody says, what do you do? As a, as a metaphor then, washing the when you're washing the dishes, you are intentionally, you are intentionally Facing, accepting, and letting go of your negative emotions. You got the idea? Exteriorly, you're just washing the dishes and everybody thinks, oh, you're doing such a good job. You really seem to be enjoying that. <laughs> but what you're doing internally, internally, is not resisting and saying, oh, damn it, why do I have to do the dishes again? We need to get a dishwasher. Let a machine do it. I'm above that. It's like a person that goes to the guru's ashram and everybody gets a household job to do. Well, wait a minute, I'm a bank executive. I'm not going to clean the toilet. You see? Uh, here I am. I'm an important person. I'm, what am I? I'm not going to sweep the floor. That happens a lot. So, washing the dishes. So, if you just wash the dishes, with the intention and your invitation 
the invitation comes with the intention. If you have the intention of, of facing, accepting, and letting go of the leftover negatives that are of your encounters with people, you see what I mean? If you have encounters with the world and it creates a negative feeling, if you don't wash that, it's going to, and washing it is eating it. If you don't eat it, it's going to fall down and collect in your body and mind as a pain body that's going to rise when the conditions are right and possess you like a zombie or a demon, you see. So this is an active practice, 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 practice. So every household duty is a spiritual practice in your in your secret household monastery. Vacuuming the floor. I'm cleaning up the pollution in my mind. And you actually feel like you're doing it. It's not like you just play at it. No. The more you practice it, the more your intention becomes firm, the more you actually begin to do it. Vacuuming the floor. I love ironing these shirts. These are my Tommy shirts. He left me about 20 of them. He bought them in uh, Tampa. And uh, they lasted, I mean, he's been dead for three years, and he bought these. <laughs> these might be 20 years old, for all I know. But they were, you know, $70 or $80 shirts. So they're holding up. Some of them are getting a little frayed. The button's a little weak, you see. But I love ironing them because they're cotton, and you have to iron them. I like ironing the ripples. I like the sound of the steam, like an engine. You see. And I like ironing the wind, feeling the heat. So when you, when you work in your spiritual laboratory of the home, you just do the dishes. You just iron the clothes. You just clean the floor. You just... Uh, uh, I think of other <laughs> wash the wash the for whatever you're doing in the household is going to be a cleaning operation. You just clean the toilet. See what I mean? Most household duties are cleanup. So when you make the your home, your household, a spiritual laboratory, you change the meaning of household duties from a burden a labor, I need servants, you see. This whole, whole uh, consumer economy uh, that was born out of the aristocracy. See, in England you had the aristocracy and the peasants. That was it. <laughs> aristocracy was bloodline. Peasants were, you're never going to be an aristocracy. You're going to be a peasant forever. Then the middle class was created through industry. Now you had a middle class that wanted to live like the aristocrats, but couldn't because they weren't bloodline. But they had money. So they began to uh, pay for servants. And even today, I'll bet in your house today, you will have a cupboard full of silver that you got and crystal that you got at your wedding and never use. What is that a symbol of? That's a symbol of aristocratic wealth. Now, the aristocrats, you see, eat with silver and china all the time. The middle class put it in a china closet and used everyday stuff every day. But then you would come in and say, oh, you're, so, you're an aristocrat. Look, you've got your silver and your china, you see. But anyway, this idea of the middle class was that you don't do physical labor because aristocrats don't do physical labor. They got servants. In the South, you had slaves. But then with the end of slavery, you have machines. Now technology. Now we got little robots. Now you go to Costco. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to get a vacuum cleaner and clean the house. You can buy a robot that runs around and cleans it for you. You don't have to do housework. You don't have to clean the toilet. So all the uh, consumer economy 
is based on the idea of you not doing any physical labor because you're an aristocrat and you don't and you're above that you see I don't clean the toilets I'm important <laughs> you see see that movement is you know and of course all of this means if you don't do any chores if you don't wash the dishes if you don't clean your plate if you don't iron your clothes you don't do anything at all you see uh, everything is leisure. Uh, you know, if, every, if you don't do these, you, you have no spiritual laboratory. You have no place to surrender to, to the, the present moment uh, through the body. You see, when we're doing household chores, the body's doing it. If you're washing the dishes, the body's doing it. If you're cleaning the floor, the body's doing it. Even though you use a vacuum cleaner, you're still doing it, you see. If you're ironing your clothes, the body is doing it. This gets your body and mind working together in one function. So in the chore, the body and mind are one. But if you have a culture that wants to separate the body and mind, so the body is something that is supposed to just sit in a lounge chair and everything is done with thinking, and machines, so you have this thinking mind punches a button for a machine to replace the body and the body just gets fat on a sofa and has all kinds of dysfunctional ailments and everything because of the accumulated uneaten food that accumulates in the body and comes up as stress disorders. Uh, most of our illnesses today are caused by uneaten food. And by that, I don't mean literally uneaten food. I mean uneaten negative emotions. Unaccepted, undigested negative emotions accumulate as pain bodies and rise to the surface and begin to uh, accumulate in the very cells of our body. So now the cells of our body begin to express the pain in our mind. And now we go to the doctor and buy drugs. And the whole pharmaceutical industry is built on creating new blood, new drugs that treat new pains or clean up the pains more effectively. However, they all leave unintended consequences or side effects. And where do the side effects go? Down to the pain body. <laughs> So you get this really great circular motion of self-generating pain and the creativity of our technologies to remove the pain but creates more side effects which creates more pain which creates more technology which creates more pain and on and on and on we go until we finally come to the point, the turning point where you say enough. I'm going to clean up my own pain. So you have to go to the source of the pain. It's not in the world. It's not in the body. You can't clean up the world. You can't clean up the body with medicine. You have to go to the source. And the source is every single moment that there is a negative emotion and you don't face it and accept it and let go of it. So. What I'm suggesting here is the spiritual or monastic laboratory for the soul evolution, for the evolution of your soul. Now this gets into what the soul is. It's not a thing. Most people think, well, it's a thing, but what is that? It's just an idea. You don't see a soul walking around. What is the experience of the soul? What is the, subject, what is the sub, subjective awareness of the soul? Since there is no objective soul, you say, oh, there is a soul, but you're looking at a body. You see what I mean? The soul is an abstraction. It's an idea. But there is one, but what is it? So we have to know the soul from the, as, as me. So how do we know the soul as I? We know the soul is I when it's liberated from pain. Ah, I see. 
and a lightness comes to your mind. A lightness comes to your body mind. So soul is body mind. Soul is the unity of body mind. And how do you get to the unity of body mind? By facing, accepting, and letting go of negatives as they happen. Now, since we all have an accumulation of pollution in our fishbowl because we fed ourselves too much, we have to learn how to eat the pain as it happens. So we eat the pain as it happens by seeing it, there is suffering, and saying, not saying, I hurt who did it, but oh, there is the feeling of hurt or pain. Isn't that interesting? I accept it. I look at it. And I don't identify with it. That means letting go. So by accepting it and looking at it without identifying with it, which means I heard who did it, if we just say there it is, that's eating it. I accept it. I eat it. Mwah. Mwah, it's good. <laughs> I eat my pain by accepting it. And I accept it by not saying you're the cause of my pain. So when we eat, we accept our pain as a feeling, as a feeling, not as a story of me, as a feeling without a story, just a feeling. When I accept that, I'm also letting go of my identification with it, which is the way I store the pain in my, in the bottom of my fishbowl that pollutes the mind in which I live. So we all, if we don't, so one, so there's two things here. Either the practice of accepting the negative as a positive. You see that? If I accept somebody hurts me, somebody looks at me, somebody, I, I'm in the Walmart line and, and somebody bumps into me. Oh, you hurt me. You bump me. Watch out what you're doing. Right there. Right there. Another piece of food goes down to the bottom of your mind. And it adds to all the other hurts down there. You see? So if I catch it right then, I say, oh, there is there is the pain. Look at that. I just noticed how that little bump created this... Mm. Oh, I accept that. I accept it. It's okay that it's there as a feeling. There's no cause to it. It's just a feeling. I accept it. And in the acceptance, I don't identify with it. So I don't say, you hurt me. Can't you watch out what you're doing? You see what I mean? Once you do that, uh, you ate, you know, the pain is already in there. And now it's going to grow, you see. So that right there. So there's the practice in the moment where the pain happens. And then there is the practice in your spiritual library where you invite the pain to come up as you're doing the dishes. You invite the, you say, you know, uh, you invite the buried pain, the fish, to come up so I can see you. And if you do that, if your intention is to welcome the buried pain, it'll start coming to the surface. And when one of them comes up, you say, oh, there you are. Isn't that interesting? You've been buried down there all that time. I let you go. You're forgiven. I let you go. And that way you begin to clear the water. Two actions. Catch the pain in the moment. Do your spiritual practices in your little spiritual laboratory at home. Mowing the lawn. Whatever it is. And all those little actions that you make part of your spiritual laboratory are metaphorical. In that you're actually washing a physical dish in time. But at the same time, you're cleaning up all of the leftovers that you didn't wash in all the years of your life. And in fact, all the years of humanity itself. You see, we are, humans are what, 10,000, 20, whatever. You know, the, the, the accumulated, totally talks a lot about this. The accumulated pain of humanity becomes a collective pain body. So any collective that you identify with, if you're black, if you're southern, if you're uh, immigrant, 
uh, Italian. Uh, there's an accumulated Irish. There is a there's a collective pain body that is accumulated, and we identify that. And when we identify with it, we become possessed by it. So then, if you're uh, Southern uh, white, you see and you identify with the collective pain of the South that lost the war, you may end up as a Civil War reenactor who's reliving the pain in order to exercise it, in order to get rid of the pain. In the same way that somebody who has been hurt at Walmart and they come home and reenact the whole event right there in their attempt to vomit up the pain. But it doesn't work because they have identified with it. Once you identify with the pain, it's yours. And it's going down. And it's going to collect at the bottom of the tank. So this whole practice we're talking about here is reversing the karma. Instead of collecting and accumulating more, we're going to reduce it. A good image is taking a big barrel full of sediment, full of pain. And you stick the hose of awareness in there, of practice, the practice of awareness. You stick it in there, turn the hose on, and suddenly, you know, if you have a barrel and maybe this much, the sediment was down here, and you, this was all clear. But you had very little consciousness because it's just about a quarter of the barrel. You stick, you stick the practice of awareness in there, and it begins to flush the sediment out, and it flows up and goes over, and gradually, the sediment goes down and you have more consciousness, more clarity, more peace, more joy, more creativity, you see? But the experience of it is people go to meditation, oh my God, all this mud, I don't, this is no good. All this sediment, I'm thinking more now than I ever did. You're flushing it out, but you think it's incoming. You think, oh my God, the sediment's coming in, there's more mud, I gotta quit this. Let me get back to my little bit of uh, clarity right there, you see? So this is just not understanding, a lack of understanding that when you create a spiritual laboratory, you're going to flush out the sediment or the, the polluted, the, the decaying food or pain. And it's, it's going to come through. You're going to see it. But it's outgoing. You're letting it go. You're not bringing it in. When we have the pain in Walmart, we're bringing in the pain. He hurt me, and then I go tell everybody how that person hurt me at Walmart. I'm just eating it over and over again. But if I practice letting go, when it happens, it's gone. It's a non-event. It was just a bump. It doesn't exist anymore. I have not dropped any more uneaten food in my mind. Okay, thank you so much for dropping in. Remember today's metaphor, clean your plate.